Hello and welcome everyone. Today we'll be discussing about how to perform diaphragmatic ultrasound in the ICU. Now diaphragm is a thin dome shaped muscle as you can see here. It is made up of two main parts. A part that is coming from the costal that is the ribs and the crural that is the vertebral bodies and a non-contractile central tendon shown here as the white. Now uh, when the diaphragm contracts it shortens and thickens pulling the dome the dome that, that you can see here downwards so that it increases the capacity of the chest and helps in inhalation the diaphragm normally has a large reserve capacity meaning that it can generate a lot of force when actually it needs uh, however true weakness of the diaphragm that is major loss of the contractile force is a rare primary cause of respiratory failure that leads to icu admission however critically in patients develop diaphragmatic weakness as they stay in the ICU, the exact reasons of which are not fully understood but inactivity and inflammation are some of the key factors that we have linked till now. Weakness of the diaphragm in the critically ill can make it harder to wean these patients on ventilator and can worsen the outcomes, overall outcomes. Evaluating how well the diaphragm is working can be important in certain ICU situations. So this is exactly where ultrasound comes into the play because we don't have much of other options where we can actually find out the contraction and the working of the diaphragm at the bedside. So how do we do the procedure? The there are two approaches. We will go with the first approach that is the subcostal approach. In this, place the patient in the semi-recumbent position, 30 to 45 degrees you need to see that the patient is having minimal sedation not overtly sedated and has adequate respiratory drive which you can find out if the p0.1 is more than two centimeters of water if it is less than that then probably you will not be able to see much of a contraction so uh, no or minimal tolerable ventilatory support when the patient is intubated and extubated if the patient is requiring a lot of ventilatory support then it is not going to be a very true relation of the diaphragmatic function so this is the probe that you use that is the abdominal probe or you can also use the cardiac probe the 2 to 5 megahertz the probe is positioned subcostally this is the subcostal area the diaphragm sorry the ribs below it is the subcostal area on the mid clavicular line this is the mid clavicular line and we are positioning it subcostally and the angle is directed medially, dorsally and cranially to reach the posterior third of the diaphragm. We are trying to reach the posterior third of the diaphragm. Regarding which side we need to do, uh, it is rare that you will find one sided diaphragmatic weakness. So for all purposes, right wing on the right side is very, very convenient because the liver is there which provides a very good eco window. Now, as you can see here, this is the liver and this is the diaphragm. Adjust the depth to optimally capture the excursion. We want to capture the excursion. So you make sure that all the excursion of the diaphragm is captured within this window. So the depth has to be adjusted likewise. Adjust gain to optimize the contrast with the surrounding structures. Try to get the best glow for the diaphragm. Adjust focus is used to optimize the image quality. So at, keep the focus at the level of the diaphragm. Now pos uh, once you have got this mode, then you put the M mode. Position the M mode perpendicular to the movement of the diaphragm focusing on the area where you find the highest movement. So it is better to go to an area like this rather than to the sides. Adjust the sweep speed to obtain at least three respiratory cycles within one frame. Okay, so the depth so that I can see the excursions, gain so to get the best contrast, focus to get the best image of the diaphragm, then the M mode, adjusting the perpendicular to the uh, movement of the diaphragm and gain to get at least three respiratory cycles in one frame. This distance is the diaphragmatic excursion. So measure the diaphragmatic excursion as we have seen there during the tidal breathing in the M mode. Place the markers at the lowest foot and the highest 
point of the inspiratory slope and measure the distance between the two on the vertical axis. So, put a cross here, put a cross here and check the vertical distance. This distance is my diaphragmatic excursion. So, the DE, seated tidal ventilation and expiration values are shown in mid and standard deviation. So, uh, the patient is seated, tidal ventilating and end expiration. So, uh, for that uh, in males it is 2 plus minus 0 0.5, in the left side it is slightly more 2.2 plus minus 0 0.6, in female it is more or less similar 1.9 plus minus 0 0.5. So, a value less than this would be considered as decreased uh, respiratory diaphragmatic function. So, relevant threshold related to the outcome, a D that is less than 10 to 15 millimeter during tidal ventilation is related with diaphragmatic dysfunction. So, this is in centimeters. If we get this decreased by 10 to 15 millimeter, if this is the normal, then if it is decreased by 10 to 15 millimeters, we will term it as diaphragmatic dysfunction. The next approach is the intercostal approach that is between the ribs. Place the patient in the same recommended position, uh, check the both criteria that is the respiratory and the ventilatory supports as we have already discussed. Here use the linear probe which is a slightly higher frequency 7 to 12 megahertz. The probe is positioned at the antero and mid axillary line between the 8th and 11th. As you can see it is more lateral. So we are trying to see this area of the lungs here, uh, so of the diaphragm here. So it is 8th to 11th intercostal space perpendicular to the chest wall at the zone of the apposition in line with the intercostal space. Again, uh, right side is sufficient enough, rarely we will find a left sided alone. So in this the measurement is a little complicated, we will go slow. So first adjust the depth to center the diaphragm, so diaphragm is at the center. Adjust again to optimize contrast, so you try to see you get the best contrast, it is a more magnified view as you can see, we can see a more clearer image of the diaphragm here. Adjust focus at this level to get the best quality. Now again go for the M mode, M line perpendicular to the diaphragm. Similar three sweeps in one frame. So measure the thickness and end inspiration. So this is the inspiration, this is the expiration. The contraction is happening, so this is inspiration. So you measure the depth, this is the diaphragm. So you measure the thickness of the diaphragm at end inspiration and end expiration of the same respiratory cycle. Place the calipers perpendicular to the fibers to the uh, direction closest at the internal margin of the pleura and the peritoneal lining without including them. So you don't include the lines. So as you can see here, you don't include the plural lines, you just include the muscle. So calculate the DTF as the inspiratory minus the uh, expiratory uh, diameter multiplied by 100 divided by the expiratory diameter. So to achieve representative results, obtain at least three measurements with a difference of less than 10%. So that time we were trying to see the excursion, here we are trying to see the contraction of the muscle. So the thickness, seated tidal breathing and end expiration, in male it is 21, 2.1 plus minus 4, 0.4 millimeters, in female it is 1.9 plus minus 4 millimeters, on left side is also similar. So uh, regarding the uh, difference in the uh, diameters of inspiration and expiration. In male it is 32 plus minus 15 percent change, in female it is 35 plus minus 16 percent change. So uh, DTF max is less than 20 percent, if it is decreased by 20 percent that means there is very little contraction, then we can say that there is a diaphragmatic dysfunction. A DTF of 25 to 33 predicts weaning failure 
and less than 20 predicts NIV failure if the patient is already on NIV and they're doing. Mind you, these values are not yet proven. So don't really go and put these values in your clinical practice as of now. These are still on research lines. So these values are not very clearly demarcated. But then for day-to-day -day practice, it can give you a definitive idea as to where your patient is going. So uh, the take home message is if the diaphragm weakness is identified, focus on reducing the patient's breathing workload. Correct the fluid overload, remove the fluid from the pleural fusion, prevent the lung collapse and address the excessive air that is NFP hyperinflation. If the diaphragm weakness is ruled out, then consider there are other causes like heart problems, psychological problems. Now currently diaphragm ultrasound as I said is not a standalone tool. Don't use these values that I have told right now into your practice directly for deciding when to perform a SBT or an extubation. They can guide you but they are not yet conclusive. So the bottom line is diaphragmatic ultrasound is a valuable bedside non-invasive way to detect or rule out diaphragmatic dysfunction in heart to win patients and can help diagnose causes of respiratory failure including traumatic nerve injury. Thank you for your patience.